On today's program, two of the world-famous sites in Israel, the Tranquil Sea of Galilee and that all-important capital, Jerusalem. Shalom. Hello again. Welcome back to our This is Israel series. Uh, this program is very important, obviously. We're going to go to Jerusalem and uh, first to the Sea of Galilee. Now, these, these two places are basic to any tour of Israel. Our uh, deluxe tour, our, our shortest, simplest tour, definitely visits uh, both of these very thoroughly. And, uh, you know, taking the story of Christ or any of the uh, Bible stories, you primarily find them set in Jerusalem or in Galilee. Uh, on the map, well, we have the Sea of Galilee up here, of course, uh, and Jerusalem right here. And, of course, uh, the West Bank, this yellow line, uh, so-called West Bank. This is uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, really. And uh, Jerusalem is uh, the inlet in the yellow line goes to Jerusalem to let the, the Jewish people from their side have a shot at the capital. Now, that is kind of ridiculous when you think of it. It was the Jewish capital 3,000 years ago. The Bible details the thing being the capital. But in any case, uh, we're going to visit the Sea of Galilee first. And, you know, the sea is made of water that comes down from Mount Hermon. Uh, there's a mountain north over the border with Lebanon where fresh, cool water comes down and uh, fills up the sea. And then the sea uh, empties it into the Jordan River and it goes down to the Dead Sea. And, you know, in a previous program, I gave an analogy of the Lord's career and the way that water goes. And I want to just repeat that and fill it in a little bit. The water that comes down from heaven is pure white. It's the snow on Mount Hermon. On the map, it's uh, way up here. And then it flows down this North Jordan River and fills the Sea of Galilee. Now, when it gets to the Sea of Galilee, it is uh, fresh, and uh, the Sea of Galilee is alive. The fish are swimming and so forth. Uh, that is the Lord coming down from heaven to the earth, pure, white, alive, and uh, starting his ministry in Galilee. Then the water proceeds down the Jordan River and goes southward toward the Dead Sea down here. Now, as it goes down, it uh, picks up particles of earth, of course, like any water would, and that is the Lord gathering up us, the salt of the earth. Finally, we go into the Dead Sea. We all die. The Lord died too. But the water of the Dead Sea rises back up into heaven with evaporation, and the prevailing winds take it north again, and it falls again on Mount Hermon, and that water is in a fixed cycle that can never come out, and... Uh, it tells the story of our resurrection to heaven and our returning to rule with Christ here on earth. So if you follow that water, you can see the career of our Lord. Now, uh, the city of Tiberias became holy in Galilee when uh, Jerusalem was conquered by the Romans. The Talmud was written there. Our ministry senior theologian, Tom McCall, stands by the water and tells us about that Sea of Galilee. <music> This is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful places in all the world. We're standing at the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the place where our Lord Jesus had most of his ministry during the three and a half years that he labored here upon the earth among his disciples and with the many crowds that were here around the Sea of Galilee. When we think about the Sea of Galilee and the ministry of the Lord, we're reminded of Mark 4, 39, when Jesus stood up in the ship, the boat that was out there on the Sea of Galilee during a very heavy storm that sometimes comes up on this remarkable lake, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So the entire lake was becalmed by the word of the Lord. 
when he spoke peace. In a very real sense, that's what he does in our own hearts. When we have storms, when the nation of Israel has turmoil, in our personal lives, when we are beset with all kinds of problems, Jesus can come and say, peace, be still. And we do indeed have peace. This has been something that the Lord has wanted to bring to Israel, nationally and personally. And even in the early days when the priesthood was established in the days of Moses, he called out the tribe of Levi and called out the chief priest, the high priest. And he said that on occasion, he was to bless the people with the famous Aaronic blessing. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, speak unto Aaron and unto his sons saying, in this way ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, the Lord bless thee and keep thee the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. So it is that the Lord blesses his people with peace, shalom. Like he blessed the Sea of Galilee with peace, like he desires to bless his people Israel with peace, like he desires to bless all those who come to him with peace, and even you with peace. Even so, shalom. Thus saith the Lord God, I shall gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. You shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel. Well, see Israel for yourself. That's the way to see it. Uh, we can show you just so much with these TV cameras. Of course, CNN, the network, could show you much more. They have more cameras, but they only want to show trouble, so you can't really see Israel unless you uh, see it with a tour. That's what I would recommend, ours or somebody's. But anyway, get over there in this life. It's very important. Well, the land is peaceful, especially the city of peace. Jerusalem is a very peaceful city. Compared to uh, American cities, it's laughably uh, more peaceful. I mean, you can take a walk at midnight. You, most places in the city uh, walk along. You can make a speech in the street. Uh, try some of that in American cities. Um, it really is, as much as its reputation for violence and everything, it just, it, it's just not true. It just isn't. Oh, uh, I used to have some statistics in my head. Uh, uh, in Jerusalem in one year, there were 10 people uh, killed in violent acts. And the same year, uh, New York City had over 2,000. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just crazy what's being done to you on the media. Uh, you know, Ken Berg went by the mayor's office in Jerusalem. That's a pretty busy place. And he talked with one of the mayor's spokesmen about that city. Well, let's talk about this beautiful neighborhood that we're standing in right now. This is Yemen Moshe. Can you give us some, some history about this area? Yes, well, uh, uh, first, Yemen Moshe, the nucleus, was a building down below uh, called the building of those who uh, dared, who, those who were not afraid. Uh, uh, those were people that came, you see, uh, in ancient times, people lived in walled cities. This was the, the substitute for an insurance agency. They were secure inside the walls. And those people who dared about 100 years ago to come out of the walls and live in the wilderness, surrounded by nothing, uh, uh, were considered to be very valiant, very those who dared. The development of Jerusalem really started at the beginning of the century when roads and machines started to spring. You know, it was very difficult. I, I always say that uh, um, there, is, there will never be a 20th century archaeology. There will never be a 20th century archaeology because, uh, it, you know, uh, in the 21st century or 22nd century, if somebody wants to build something, he clears the area and builds on. 
In the past, people used to build on top. So the development of Jerusalem was very much constrained by the walls. The fact that people came out of the walls allowed hundreds of thousands of people to come to Jerusalem with the development of roads and cars, etc. Now a city of 700,000 people could not live inside the city walls. Those pioneers built this area. Now, this area was quite abandoned until 1967 after we uh, liberated the Jewish quarter and the old city in 1967, uh, we established this as, a, uh, as an artist community. But very soon it became very uh, elegant uh, sort of housing. It's very close to the walls of the old city, it's very close to the western wall, the remnant of our temple, and uh, it became a very, uh, very nice, uh, traffic-free kind of a community uh, that uh, makes us proud. So who lives in, in these apartments? Or these are houses, is that correct? These are houses, most are houses, and people who bought the apartments. Uh, we have uh, uh, people, some of the leaders of the Jewish people have homes here. Uh, some others uh, that have been here for a long time uh, uh, that are not uh, that wealthy, but they have uh, quite a wealthy property. Well, it's my understanding that some Americans have lived here. Americans are also free to come here as everybody else. Yeah, well, the fact is that Americans can freely come and go, that uh, Jerusalem has a uniqueness about it. There's, there's a beckoning of Jerusalem and Israel to those who live in the United States. The whole idea of America, of establishing America, was A, freedom, B, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. For the first time in history, these years, the past 30 years, everybody is free to come to Jerusalem and worship his own God or her own God. Uh, this is for the first time that Jerusalem is free. This is the first time that Jerusalem has fulfilled not only the Jewish dream, but also the American dream, the American dream of being able to do. Now, I'm not considering the media, I'm not considering the slander of the media and, and taking things that are minuscule and augmenting its size to unbelievable proportions. This is a city in which my wife walks freely in the evening and even in the middle of the night. This is a city where my children walk freely. This is a city where all your listeners, or all the people, all your viewers can come here and be with us and celebrate with us the millennium. This is a city that we truly hope to turn into the city of peace. And funnily enough, when you come into the city and you see the quiet surroundings, when you see the politics free, Jerusalem, you find out that this is one of the unique cities in the world. And I hope uh, most or lots of your viewers and listeners will avail themselves of the opportunity and come to be with us. Well, as I look around, it certainly is a city of peace. Uh, the streets are beautiful, the flowers are out, but this is not the picture, as you said, from the media. And I guess that's the reason that many Americans think of this location as something that's it's a dangerous area to come to. Well, if you take an average American city with 700,000 inhabitants, you have more violent deaths a year, 10 times more than we have here in Jerusalem, including terrorism. Uh, I don't want to compare it to any particular city, but when we're talking about Jerusalem, we're talking about number of murders a year that doesn't reach the number of my fingers. When we're talking about Jerusalem, we talk about, yes, there have been about three, 400 people that died in the past 50 years in own cards, all kinds of terrorism attacks. But I don't want to let the, terrorism, the terrorists win, and they do not deter me. And sometimes when I walk in the streets of New York or in the streets of Dallas, Texas, or in the streets of Los Angeles, I feel more threatened than if I walk in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, believe you me, you can walk with me at any time of day and night, and you will see the peace. And it will give you an opportunity to think about the most important things in life, not only about the urgent things that you are doing and that we all do day after day.
Uh, I may be remiss, you know, in constantly mentioning CNN as a critic of Israel. Uh, give credit to the other uh, uh, networks. I mean, Mike Wallace of, of uh, uh, CBS is certainly one of the most vicious critics of Israel. Uh, uh, Ted Koppel on ABC, uh, Peter Jennings, te terrible. So I don't want to single out CNN. BBC in Britain deserves full credit for constantly uh, berating the place. And the written press. Uh, I don't know why it sells. That, that's all the press cares about is, is, is making a profit. Let, let's get this right. It's not a public service. It's a, like a store. It's a profit-making business. And for some reason, Israel sells. I've said it before. It's like, uh, like Jackie Kennedy used to sell in the tabloids. And for 20 years, we had to read Jackie Kennedy stories. Uh, now we have to read Israel stories. And I hope they'll just get their attention on somebody else for a while. Uh, as far as it being peaceful, my goodness, uh, you know, during the time when the scuds were falling on Tel Aviv, when Saddam Hussein was was shelling this nation, it wasn't even part of that war, it was totally innocent of any any part of it, uh, was shelling them. Uh, I did a survey of um, uh, how likely you were to be injured by a ballistic projectile in the streets of Dallas and in the streets of Tel Aviv. I have news for you, you were 20 times more likely to be shot in Dallas than to be hit with one of those missiles. I mean, even at the worst time, at wartime, it's a more peaceful place than this is. Well, there's a famous walking mall in the middle of Jerusalem, and a lot of people talk about war and peace there, and I refer to Ben Yehuda Street. All of our tours visited. It's uh, it's an open-air uh, mall uh, similar to a shopping center, but out in the, the street. They paved over a street. And uh, we go there and we ask, you know, because they say where there's uh, two Israelis, there's three opinions. We ask some of those opinions at Ben Yehuda Street. And what's been your reaction to Israel? Have you enjoyed being here? Oh, this is our fourth time to come. And um, two years ago when someone told us in America that it may not be safe, the first year they said the same thing. I said to the person who was bringing us over, is it really safe? And she said, Elizabeth. It's the safest place you could ever be. She said the streets of Chicago and New York are worse than the streets of Jerusalem and, and Israel. The image that we get in the United States is pretty much that of uh, bombs, dusty roads. Do uh, you think that's the case here? Uh, no, not at all. Yeah, I think it's uh, very much developed. As a matter of fact, I think it's developed a lot in the past 10 years uh, since I've been here. So uh, definitely not. So would you say this would be a good place to come for a vacation? Definitely. Definitely. That's why I'm here, actually. So what's your overall feelings of Israel? Is it a safe place to be? Oh, it's a real safe place. My wife and I were out last night at 11 p.m. walking around the Hilton, and uh, we're just real comfortable here and, and uh, feel almost more comfortable than we do in any downtown major city in the U.S. Uh, do you think that the picture that's painted of Israel in the United States is an accurate one? It's not accurate because... Uh, for example, when I told my friends I was coming to Israel, they would say, what, are you crazy? Are, are you, are, aren't you afraid? And, and I would just tell them, well, no, it's actually, I feel more safe in Israel than I, than I do in many places in the United States. Uh, we're here as a group, yes, spiritually, and also on a vacation. What's been your overview of Israel? What do you feel? Is it a safe place to be? It's my first visit here, my, my wife's second visit. Yes, I think so. I had a number of people that say to me, I can't believe you're going to Israel, but uh, I feel safe. I'm not, I'm not afraid at all to get out on the streets. I'm just as safe here as I would be in any part of Europe and much safer than being somewhere in Asia. This is a land where just, you know, the major significant events of our faith happened. And, and so to, to be here and, and to be close to those places is, is to touch a part of our story. And, and yeah, I think there's, there's, it's spiritually significant to make a pilgrimage here. If you feel drawn to Israel, if you feel drawn to come to Jerusalem, uh, it certainly is not anything to be concerned about. Not anything to be concerned about. Although the media seems to have a problem covering the positive things happening in Israel, we find it a joy to bring you the good news. I talked to Clarence Wagner about Bridges for Peace. Clarence, uh, tell me about the ministry Bridges for Peace. Well, Bridges for Peace is an evangelical Christian ministry that was founded right here in Jerusalem. And our work is trying to build understanding between Christians and Jews and also trying to reach out to our Christian friends to help them understand about Israel, about the Jewish roots of Christianity, and in turn, 
bring back into Israel uh, their, their love, their concern, their contributions to bless the people of Israel. And we do this through a variety of programs here in the country. You know, over your shoulder, I see a scene so different. I see black people at a sukkah. That's right. <laughs> now, these are uh, people from? They're from Ethiopia. Ethiopia. The Ethiopian children and families, the season of the year, and of course, is Sukkot and the booths outside of their little trailers. These people have come here by the thousands, uh, 15,400 in one airlift alone a number of years ago. And the, they were starving in Ethiopia. They were starving right, in Ethiopia. Thanks. What happened, uh, the Ethiopian uh, government had told them they could come out of the Gondar Mountains into uh, the airport area and leave to go to Israel, and at the last minute changed their mind. And over 15,000 of these Ethiopian uh, Jews uh, literally camped out around the tarmac of the airport. We provide for them brand new blankets, uh, things for their kitchen, pots and pans and cutting boards. We distribute one ton of food every single day. A ton of food a ton a day. Ton of food a day. We have Christian volunteers who are gleaning the fields, and we buy an awful lot from factories and suppliers. And we, um, we bring it out to the people, to the community centers, and they also come to us. Okay, you're established here in Jerusalem where the Orthodox are the, the, the center of world Judaism. Of course, you're a Christian organization. Uh, what's the response of the local Jewish community? Well, the response has really been quite, quite warm from all, all ranks. Uh, Bridges for Peace has stepped in and helped in areas where other groups haven't even helped, even in the Jewish community. We started a program because prophecy said that in the end of days the Gentiles would come and even be repairers of the breaches of the walls of Jerusalem. And just like Nehemiah came back and rebuilt uh, the walls and the city and so on, we sent our Christian work crews out to Maya Shirim and other religious neighborhoods where Christians weren't welcome because of what happened in Europe. And there we found elderly people in, in their homes. One man, we saw his picture in the paper, and he was, the story was about how poor the poor really are, some of these old people. So we went and we found him, and our Israeli who works for us spoke to him and talked with him in, in Hebrew and told him what we did, that we helped poor people. And you know, this very poor old man stood up and took a little coin out of his pocket and says, oh, if you help poor people, I, I, I want to help. Oh. And they said, no, we've come to the help you. <laughs> we've come to help you. Yeah. And this repairs crew got started with him, and we fixed his house from top to bottom, put windows and doors and plastering and painting and wiring and fixed this leaky roof he had. It was draining out over his bed. And we began doing this now, and over we've done it for over 250 such homes, these single-room homes in these poor religious neighborhoods. But because of this, the religious community, the Orthodox community, has seen that Maybe not all Christians are like those in the past, those of Europe who hated us and persecuted us and killed us. Maybe, maybe these Christians aren't so bad. Well, we hope they would see that the, the Jesus that we believe in, the Messiah that we worship, is who motivates us to come and bring this love to them. Well, Israel is a place of peace even now, uh, but especially it will be when Sar Shalom returns, the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. Uh, Zechariah 14, 16 points out, you know, the most peaceful festival is the Feast of Tabernacles, the Thanksgiving Day of Israel. And it says in that scripture, And it shall come to pass that everyone that's left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So for a thousand years, and I'm telling you now because you're going to be living in Jerusalem, uh, for a thousand years you'll see the people of all nations coming up and celebrating this wonderful and peaceful feast in a wonderful and peaceful city. But until he comes, Jerusalem is said by Zechariah to be a burdensome stone, uh, something that uh, people try to handle and cut themselves with it. His images are compelling. He is the, the great prophet of the end times. Uh, Bible readers are well aware of uh, 
what the times uh, are like and what the, what the Lord warned us about as signs of the tribulation and how uh, the things we're seeing in Jerusalem really dovetail with prophecy. Uh, Bible readers are aware of it. The Muslims, of course, are not aware of it. The Pope is not aware of it. You just have to read the scriptures and take them seriously to understand. Uh, the Muslims pretend to make peace. Uh, the Pope pretends to uh, believe the Muslims' pretense of making peace, and on it goes. But there is no peace. As the scripture itself says, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Uh, men will, will say peace and safety, and then sudden destruction will come upon them. Uh, that's... Uh, that's all part of the times until uh, uh, the Lord himself returns. As to uh, whether it's a dangerous place to visit, I get this question all the time. Oh, listen, if I can get out of Dallas and get to Jerusalem, then I can sleep. But let's put it that way. Uh, it's not that Dallas is so dangerous, but Jerusalem is far less dangerous, and Israel in general is far less dangerous than America. Their terrorism, which we talk about as some kind of daily event, is so puny. I mean, let's face it. I, I, I've told it before, but uh, this bomb that uh, went off, a fellow tried to bomb some people in a shopping center in Tel Aviv. I took a survey. How many people were killed, I said, after the networks on television and all the print media and everybody reported this thing day after day after day after day? And I just took a kind of a survey among my friends. Did you hear the story about the Tel Aviv bombing? Oh, yes. How many people did, were killed there? Do you remember? I got estimates of, I don't know, 200, 500, even 1,000. The total number of casualties there, one. <laughs> the, what they're calling bombs are almost little firecrackers, and the bombers aren't very good at it, not like in Oklahoma City, not like at the World Trade Center. I'm afraid the terrorism that we have that, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we skip over uh, in favor of theirs is far worse. It really is. But that's why we made this program, uh, this series, This is Israel, is to tell you what it really is so you don't have to listen to the networks and CNN and the, and the press because they're just not telling you what it is. So we went to the expense and the trouble. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the series so far, and we're going to make available in our offer tonight all 12 programs that are finished on tape. Uh, get this whole series. It's well worth uh, having. Listen, buy a separate copy and send it to each network, will you? It'll help us, and it sure ought to help them. At least uh, they can sit down and see what they've been doing, as if they don't know. But uh, call their attention to it. Uh, also, you can get our Levitt letter and our catalog. Those things are free. You know, we print a, a monthly letter, and, uh, uh, and then a personal letter also comes along during the month. And uh, you can keep up with our ministry. Our catalog shows all the offers have been made on all the programs from the beginning. And remember the gifts of funds, folks. That's how we really do these things. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you.